Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, it is 10 a.m. Central, my time, and so it's time for us to start the webinar. Welcome. I'm excited to see we have so many people joining us today for our session that's going to be on reports, tools, and administration. My name is Karen. I'm one of the educators here at Bywater Solutions. I am joined on today's webinar by my colleague, Margaret. So, Margaret, could you just say hello? Good morning, everyone. And we have, uh, Margaret has some uh, just things to be aware of when you're posting in chat today. So I'll let her tell you about that. Thank you, Karen. Um, please post your questions to Q&A. If you choose to post your questions in chat, just be aware that you have the option to post to panelists or panelists and attendees. If you choose the panelists and attendees option, your question will be visible to everyone. I'll be logging all your questions, and then Karen and I will go over them each at the end. Yes, so if you have joined me for other webinars this week, they were relatively short. Today is going to be a little bit longer. It's probably going to be about 40 minutes. So we have quite a few enhancements to discuss in those different modules, and then we'll answer questions at the end. All right, so I'm very excited to have you all here today. Um, and I'm going to get started talking about some enhancements. Oh, actually, let me get started by giving, telling you more about the upgrades. So upgrades are going to be starting on November 2nd, and they're going to continue throughout the month. All upgrades are going to start after 8 p.m. your local time, and we will populate your staff client in the news section with the uh, date that you're going to be upgraded. So if you have any questions um, about that process, just let us know, but that's what you can expect for us. And if you have any issues after you go live, try clearing your cache first. That usually solves most of the issues. And if not, just open a ticket with us and let us know what's going on and we'll get it solved for you. Um, or you can also give us a call too, of course. So first, I just want to mention the upgrade webinar schedule. This is the last upgrade webinar we have this week. Next week, we have some more. Um, we're going to be doing OPAC and public services, circulation and patrons, technical services. So if you haven't been to those, those are definitely some ones you would like to check out. You can just register here on this page. And Margaret uh, has posted the schedule for you. So you can go directly there. We have two town hall sessions coming up, one at the end of November and one in mid-December. And we will announce those on our partners list, as well as what the topics are going to be. So we hope to see you at another session. I, I see some familiar names in here already today, so I'm happy to see some returnees. And I also want to mention that we have our Koha upgrade notes. So on this page, you'll see some important links for this upgrade, the community release notes. Um, we have a Koha manual, so you might want to go ahead and bookmark that. We have created several blog posts and videos for what we see are the major enhancements. So we'll walk you through the steps for those. We have also recorded our webinars, so if there was one that you wanted to go to but you missed, you can get uh, access to it here. This just connects to our YouTube channel, bywatersolutions.com, and it, we, are con we are continually posting videos there, so if you want to keep up with the latest in co-op, just subscribe to our channel. We also have Q&A from other upgrade webinars, so if you were with me for the two other sessions this week, I've posted some answers to your questions there. And then, of course, this is a list of all the enhancements that are now in Koha 1705. This is a link to the bug number, and you can click here and read more about it. All right, well, let's get started with some enhancements in reports. Okay, so we now have um, an enhancement, so where you can see the last date that a report was edited. So I'm gonna go right into our reports, and go into saved. And you'll notice there is now the last edit date. So that will tell you the last time that report was edited. You can see here we have a few edit, few recent edits, several going back for some years. So now you will now see that column in your system. And another new feature that we have here is how many reports you want to show. So we have this now defaulting to 100. There is a new system preference for this. It's called num saved reports. I'm gonna go into that and show you that system preference.
And you can now set the default of how many reports you would like to see on that page. So our default is set to 100, and you can configure that to be whatever you would like it to be. All right. Um, now I have, well, I have some interesting news about reports. So one thing that happened in this latest upgrade is that the column mark XML was moved out of the Biblio items table and into a separate one. This caused some issues. Just to let you know, we, um, basically it broke any reports that are using mark XML, but don't panic. We have it sorted out for you. Uh, one thing that has happened is there is now a fix for this. So you might see this update SQL button and you can go in here and use this to fix your report. It may not work on all reports. So what we have done is we have identified which partners have issues. We will notify you about this and we will work on a fix for you. So we have it taken care of. Um, we have looked at the last time reports have run and that's how we're prioritizing which reports to fix first. So it could last anywhere from a week to several weeks to get these reports fixed for you. So what we're gonna do is um, by next Monday, we're gonna be posting a blog post on our blog about how you can fix this yourself. And so I'll be editing that post this week and that's gonna be coming up. So we will take care of that on your end and we will also give you instructions for how to take care of it yourself. And if it's something you need immediately, please open a ticket and let us know and we will prioritize that for you. So we're so sorry that this has happened, but I just wanna reassure you that we're on top of this and um, I'm editing the blog post today and we will have it out by next week at the latest. So Barton has written that report for us. And um, you know, again, we're sorry, but fixing this is really our priority for you. So. Thanks for your patience with this with this one thing. This is the only issue that I have to talk about today. So everything else is working great. Okay, so we have um, a new thing in reports here too. If we go in to, we'll show this report. And we have, oh, actually, that's not what I wanted to do. Just a second. I'm going to edit this report. And we should have the option here um, to toggle to the SQL, but I'm not seeing it in here. Um, okay, so just a second. Maybe it's not part of this one. Oh, I apologize. I thought I had really good notes, but I guess I'm missing this one. Um, okay, well, I will come back to this. So the next thing to talk about with reports is the overdue report. So in our overdue report, we now have a new sorting option. Um, let me run the overdue report. And you can see that there's a new sorting option now where you can sort on call number. I'll just run this and we'll see all our overdues here and you can see there's now the new option to sort with call number. So if you had multiple items in this overdue report, they would all now be sorted by the call number field. And we also have a new way to export circulation history. So if I go into my account, I'll just show you what this feature looks like. You can now export using CSV. So if you wanted to export a patron circulation history, there is now an option to export it with CSV. This is kind of um, an interesting system preference because it replaces one that we had previously in the system. So this is just a new name for this preference. Um, the new preference is called export circ history. Okay, 
And so now it will show the export patron checkout history options. Um, it's replacing the export with CSV profile um, if that was set or the export remove fields was set before. So this is just a slightly different system preference, just a new name. And if you had it set before, it was carried over into the new system. Okay. Um, so up next, okay, we just have an improved wording. I'm going into the tool section now. So we have an improved wording. There are a lot of little enhancements in Koha, like improved wordings or um, usability design. So you will see a few of those today. And this is in the patron card creator. And we'll go into manage card batches. Edit a batch. And if we select a patron and we click remove selected patrons, there's just some new wording here that asks, are you sure you want to remove the selected patron? So I believe before it said, are you sure you want to remove the card number? Now it just asks, are you sure you want to remove the selected patron? So just a tiny new enhancement, but hopefully that adds a little more clarity to the patron card creator. Right, we have another, uh, Another new feature here. So with our patron card creator, where it will recognize if you are entering duplicate file names for images. So if I were to upload another image, here of me, um, and I called it the same name again, you would see that we now get a warning that an image with this name already exists. But if you were to upload it with a different name, there's me, um, you can call it, so if I were to call it Karen Holt 2, it would upload just fine, even if it's the same image. So if you have that same name, then um, it, Koha now recognizes that. Okay, so now I wanna talk about the auto member card number generation. So what previously happened when you were entering a new patron record and you had the um, auto member num preference turned on is that the uh, card number was generated whenever you went into that record. So now you'll see that um, it's generated after you hit save. And the reason for that is that uh, if two people at different branches are going in and creating a patron record, they don't get the same number and then get an error at the end. So now Koha will store that number for you if you're using auto member num uh, after you hit save. So just a slight new enhancement there, but hopefully when um, for people at multi-branch systems, that makes that a little bit easier for you. We also have a new feature called account lockout. So uh, now after a number of failed login attempts, a user account, uh, a user can become locked out of their account. Let me show you how that works. So if our patron here enters the wrong password, then they will get a message that their account has been locked and they have to reset their password. They can go here to this link and then enter in their information. So there are a couple system preferences that tie into this. So one is failed login attempts. And then you can determine how many you would like to set it so that uh, patron's account would be failed. So in this case, we've set it to three. So if they have three failed login attempts, then they will be locked out of their account. Now, in order for this to work, you have to have the OPAC reset password set up. This was a new system preference that came out in Koha 1611. So a really brand new one for us 
and uh, this preference basically um, allows the patron to recover their password via email. So you have to have that set up if you wanted to use that lock account feature. And then that patron will also get a notification that they have been uh, locked out of their account. So let me go into that. Right, and I'm gonna go into my notices. And you can see there's the Koha password recovery email. So this is how it's automatically configured in your system. And it will send this email to your patron as well as give them the opportunity to log in and recreate their password. Okay, um, just out of curiosity, are any of y'all using the news feature? So we have a new system preference for news. You'll see here, I have set a piece of news here that shows to all of our, um, all of our patrons coming. Okay, I see Heather saying she loves the news feature. Awesome. So we just, there's a little bit of an enhancement to news. Um, I have this set up to show to everyone coming to this site, this particular news item, but there's now a news feature where you can see news from the individual branches. So this is OPAC News Library Select. That's our preference. So we'll take a look at that. Okay, so the OPAC News Library Select is set to Don't Display. I'm going to select Display, a branch select and list for news items in the OPAC. So we'll see now how that looks in our system. Let's refresh. Okay, so now we have Display News for System-wide. So this is our system-wide news. I set up a little news for our East Branch. We're going to have a little knitting club meeting. So um, now your patrons with this OPAC uh, news library select feature turned on, they can go and look at individual branches and see what's going on there. So I think that's a really fun enhancement. Um, I, as an academic librarian, I always worked in outreach and engagement. And so um, I just, I love this. All right, so now i um, just gonna talk about notices, but there is now a resend button for notices that have failed in your system. Oh, I see Heather says she wishes a knitting club came along with the enhancement. I know, right? Wouldn't that be fun? I was thinking we should start a book club or something um, with partners. So I, I might work on that idea a little more. I wonder if you guys would be interested. Maybe we could do some virtual knitting together. Um, all right. So in our notices, um, technically in uh, the last upgrade, this feature was here, but it was hidden by some CSS. So now I can do a big reveal. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> Just seeing the Partners Book Club. Okay, cool. I think it would be so fun. All right. Okay. I'm totally going to work on that. I'll email y'all later. Um, but now you can see if your notices have failed, um, there's an option to resend. So unfortunately, that was hidden last time, but it's here now. And you can always resend those notices. Uh, if they failed. And of course, um, you would get failed notices back to your uh, email address and you can go through here and resend those if you have updated emails, et cetera, for your patrons that aren't getting them. Okay, so we now have a kind of a big new enhancement uh, for multi-branch systems. So uh, for overdue notices before, when a patron had overdues on items from different branches, Koha would send an overdue notice from each branch with both items listed. So in a sense, your patron would get two notices with the same items listed from two different branches. So now there's been a change that um, if libraries have notices set up for individual branches and they're at a multi-branch system, the patron will receive an email from that branch with a specific item that is overdue. Um, so I'll just show you quickly. There's not really so much to show with this, but we just have it set up in our system um, just for, the, for uh, the visual learners like myself out there among us. 
um, for that notice. And it would be um, now because we have our overdue notice, so we have one in here in the system that goes to all libraries. And you'll see we have one here that also goes to the South Branch. So basically, anybody that had something from the South Branch would get an overdue notice with the item that they had overdue at the South Branch now. And then if they had an overdue at another branch, they would get that too. So just a little more, um, hopefully a little more user friendly for your users, just making it a little more clear where they have items due. Okay, um, so we also have a great new enhancement with notices, which is the ability to translate notices. Um, I was really excited because I thought, oh, Koha's going to translate now, but actually it doesn't. It doesn't do any of the translation, but if you're using any other languages, Koha translates the notice template into different languages. And so you can select a preferred language setting in your user account. So for those of you who have uh, patrons that have preferred languages in other accounts, there is now a preferred setting for languages that you can set. So I've set mine to Spanish. You have to have a language pack enabled on your system. We have Spanish enabled on this one. And so you can set up that notice language. Um, and we have uh, a sample notice to show you. So if I go back into our notices and slips, I'll show you how that looks in the notice. All right. So I'm gonna go into bill. And you see we now have the option for Spanish notices. And we've had somebody actually do the translation for us. Of course, you can use whatever translation tools are out there, native speakers or, or speakers of other languages that you have available to put that language into, um, into the notification for you. And then this will ensure that the person's getting their notification in the language that they prefer. So pretty cool. Oh, and we also have another system preference tied into this called OPAC language display. So let me just show that one. Uh -huh. OPEC languages display, there we go, there was an S. So now you can allow patrons to change the language they see in the OPEC. And you can see the OPEC languages that we have in here now are English and Spanish. So kind of, yeah, I think that's a really fun new enhancement too. Um, okay, so another new system preference we have is, hopefully gonna make some lives easier here. It's exclude holidays from max pickup delay. I know I've answered quite a few tickets on this. So now we have a system preference that takes closed days into account when calculating the reserves max pickup delay. So that's for your holds. So now holds will be calculated if you have this set to allow um, with that reserve. Uh, with that pickup delay for all the holidays that you're closed. So this is really great. Super excited about this. Um, of course, you can also keep it turned off if you don't want to allow that, but hopefully that'll um, alleviate some of the confusion about when um, those holds are set based on using your calendar. And we have also written a blog post about this too. Okay, um, I'm going to go into system administration now. So uh, the preferences that I want to talk about are the sharing of anonymous usage statistics. So we have HEA. This is a service to collect usage data, data from libraries using Koha. And with this development, uh, let me scroll down here, um, HEA or HEA, um, can collect the geolocations of the libraries and installation and create a map. And there's also a new configuration page uh, that can allows you to configure what information is shared with the Koha community. 
So I'll just uh, quickly show y'all the HIA Koha community website. You can see some information about who's using Koha around the world with people that are sharing their statistics. Um, you also, of course, have the option of sharing them or not sharing, whatever you're comfortable with. That's all pretty much anonymous data being sent out there, but kind of cool. I, I really, I love seeing all the countries here. Um, so Bhutan, wow. Um, and there are just all these countries using Koha. So yay, Koha community all around the world. So we can see those statistics right here and you can see what people are using, different, how many holds, et cetera. So this is some kind of fun data about Koha. And then you can see here, we have this new geolocation. So um, you can decide, you know, again, if you wanna share that or not share that. All right, so next we have our classification sources. Previously, if you were uh, entering a new classification, it, Koha wouldn't automatically tell you that it was new and you would get an error. So this basically is just a check that checks if the code already exists. So we're going to add a new classification source. And I, for some reason, did not notice that I had a Dewey in there. And I go to save it. And I now we'll get a message that it's failed to add it. Um, and it's really quite nice, right? Perhaps the code already exists. What a gentle suggestion. So that's some new wording in there. Um, and we have a really fabulous new enhancement. I don't know if y'all noticed, we have the search system preferences up here. Before, if you were on the administration page, it would say search the catalog first, and now it goes automatically to search system preferences. So hopefully just something that makes it a little bit easier for you in that administration page. And you can just enter whatever global system preferences you're looking for right there. Okay, um, the next one is kind of a, a little uh, a little one, uh, audio alerts. So you, it says you can define audio alerts here. And it now gives you a note that you have to enable the system preference audio alerts if you want to use it. That wasn't in there before, but now it gives you that little warning and you can look for audio alerts and you can enable it. And now when we go back into audio alerts, we don't have that warning anymore and everything's working fine. So just a small new enhancement there um, for audio alerts messaging. All right, uh, now I'm gonna talk a little bit about authentication. Um, I don't really have anything to show, just a little news. Um, with Shibboleth auto-provisioning, so this feature allows uh, the creation of new patron records from Shibboleth into Koha, um, also I guess known as provisioning, and it's possible to map Shibboleth's attributes with Koha fields. And this configuration is done in the Koha-conf.xml. So you can sync, uh, uh, sorry, I should say syncing existing Koha users with Shibboleth, we don't have yet, but this is for new patron records. So if you guys are using Shibboleth, that's some good news for you. Uh, we also have a removal. So we've removed, or uh, Koha removed Mozilla Persona as an authentication method. And it seems that Persona never really took off. And so um, many browsers supported it, but very few services implemented it. So Mozilla ended this project. Uh, they closed that on November 30th of 2016. So now this feature has been deleted from Koha. Right, um, up next, I just wanna talk a little bit about the hold fee. So um, if anyone's implementing a hold fee, this feature applies to you. The hold fees are set at the patron level, so you can determine if your patrons have a hold fee. And previously, they were charged a hold when they placed the hold. And now there are a few new options for when they can be charged the hold. So that's called hold fee mode, this new system preference, or rather it's an old system preference, but just has some new options. So they, are, they can be charged anytime a hold is collected. So they would not actually be charged when they place the hold, but when they picked it up, 
And uh, we still have the option here anytime a hold is placed, and also only if all items are checked out and the record has at least one hold already. So if you are charging your patrons a hold fee, there are just a couple more options there that hopefully make it a little bit better for your patrons. And so again, the hold fees are set in the patron category, and this enhancement will only affect new patrons created in the system. If you make changes to patron categories, we can retroactively change patrons of that category so that that hold fee can be charged to all your patrons rather than just the new patrons. All right. Um, well, I, that was the last thing I had to talk about. So this went actually pretty quickly, a little quicker than I was thinking it would. Um, so now I have time for your questions. Right. Um, so, Margaret, what is our first question? Our first question comes from Linda. So, would you be able to show us the blog's location again and when the blog post about Mark XML will be available? Yes, great question. Okay, well, you know, I, um, I'm using Google here, so, like, uh, Bywater blog. Or actually, I guess I'll come to our homepage and go to the blog. So if you guys haven't seen this before, we try to post at least once a week. Uh, different staff members take turns posting on our blog. We have a nice section called Tips and Tricks. So we try to post um, any new enhancements. We have blog posts on that. We also have, um, if I see something coming up in support a lot, I'll do a little blog post about it. Like for example, material type and how that's controlled by the leader. We have um, who's gone live. Uh, you can do a search over here for a specific category if you're looking for. We have tutorial videos that you can search for. So the blog post, this is where it's going to be appearing. And I'm editing it today. Um, my goal is to get it up on Friday, but I'm trying to be like Amazon and overpromise. So um, check next week. It'll definitely be there for sure. All right. So that's um, our blog. And then, of course, any posts related to our upgrade notes, we can find, uh, oh, I should say, Margaret sent the link, but I have it up already, and I will also put the blog post on here. And so you guys got sent the link to this, so I will add that blog post here on the overview blog posts and videos. And again, any additional information, um, I'll put it under the Q&A as well, any questions from today. So great question, thank you. Um, next question. The next question came up while we were discussing reports. Okay. To update the SQL in Koha reports, will staff need to just click that update SQL button that was displaying? Yeah. Or should we prepare to go into the SQL edit area on behalf of those staff that aren't comfortable doing uh, that task? Okay. Um, so I'll say as far as I understand, you just click that button. I haven't tried it out yet. Um, and I will be posting the instructions. So if you wanted to be sure, then that would be the way. But as far as I understand it right now, you would click that button and it would help repair whatever's going on. Although not all reports are going to be repaired by that. So I just wanted to put that caveat out there. Um, so we'll post the instructions and then we'll take care of any reports. And, but if you want it to be faster, then definitely try to do it yourself and see if you can get that repaired. Again, we apologize about the reports that have been broken. It does seem to have impacted mainly academic libraries, and again, we'll notify you if you have any instances of that after you've um, been upgraded. Okay, do we have any more questions, Margaret? Yes, we do. All right, good. The next question, also about reports, comes from Christopher. For the export CERC history feature, mm -hmm. is it their actual CERC history and dependent on the settings related to keeping that data? Or is it just what is currently checked out? That is a great question. Let's run it and see what happens because I'm not actually sure. Okay. I'll export CSV. Aha. So you have to select the checkouts you want to export.
Great question. Okay, so now we should just export the currently checked out items. Let's just see what it looks like. I love experimenting with y'all. All right, so this is what we get. We get just a list, um, I guess a, a little list um, with the title and the author information. All right, great question. Okay, next question, Margaret. All right, our next question came up during the tools discussion from Tam. If we do not allow OPAC reset password, then the patron login lockout will not work. Is that correct? Yes. That's we are currently using LDAP Authenticate, so they cannot reset their email. Okay, that's correct. It won't work if you don't have that setting turned on. So of course they can always um, contact you and let you know they've been locked out. Good question. Okay, Margaret, next question. Our next question came up during the notices discussion from Carol. Would we be able to pull a report that will show us the list of all notices that failed that day to resend? Yes, Carol, you can definitely create a report that would show that as well as you would receive uh, the notices that weren't sent out to their, I believe it's the admin email you have in your system. So you would be notified that way and you can also create a report. Okay, next question. All right, our next question came up during the system administration discussion and this one's from Ed. If it is currently off, do we need to submit a ticket to have the cron set up for the HEA data push. Um, sorry, Margaret, could you read that again? Sure. Um, if it's currently turned off, do we need to submit a ticket to have the cron set up for the HEA, HEA data push? That is a great question, Ed. I do not know the answer to that. I can definitely find out and post it in um, our Q&A session. So that's what I will do. Good question. Okay, um, next question, Margaret. Our next question also comes from Ed. The classification code source duplication checking. Mm -hmm. Is that only matching on the code, not the description? Another great question. Um, I'm not sure. I, I had assumed it was matching on the code, um, but we all know about assumptions. Let's check it out. Let's see. All right. Okay, so we will just, I'm just going to put Oh, wait. Let's see the best way to handle this. So I think um, just checking on the code. What if I try Dewey? Well, we're just experimenting. Let's just see. Yep, so it's the code. Okay, I hope that answered your question, Ed. All right, next question. All right. Our next question comes from Christopher. Some questions about resending the notices. Is there a way to do this on mass as opposed to going into accounts individually? Can you resend a notice that didn't fail? Okay, great questions. Um, I am not sure about resending on mass. That would be a fabulous enhancement and I will check on that and I will post the answer in the Q&A, if not today, then tomorrow and let you know for sure. Um, can you resend a notice that didn't fail? No, not at the current time. So you only have that option for notices that have failed. Okay, Margaret, next question. Next question is also from Christopher. Does the text of the notice remain fixed after it was first generated or if notice language slash formatting was changed after it was first sent, will those changes be reflected? 
Ooh, another good question. Um, another good question. Well, let's just do an experiment here. I think it's going to stay fixed because I think it's going to send that same notice again. All right, we have a failed. That is a good question. I'm, I think I might just have to test this a little more extensively and see what happens. Because right now I would have to go in and change the wording. Yeah, let me test that and I will get back to you on that. Okay, yeah, sure. Um, great questions, really great questions. I'm glad you guys um, like to make me think. Um, okay, more, do you guys have more questions? I see a new anonymous question. Okay. Anything new with the advanced search or item search areas? Anything new with item search, item search. Um, yes, we do have something new with item search. All right, so in item search, we now have the option here to export a barcode file. So if we were to do a barcode search, um, let's see, we'll do a last checkout date here. Search for items and we will export a barcode with our search results. Okay, so this is a new feature that we have for item search. You can just get a printout of your, um, of your barcodes, which is really great. If you wanted to go in and do some batch item modification, you can just take this file and upload it or batch item deletion. And um, yeah, it's really nice. I think that's a really nice new feature with items. Item search. Okay, um, any other questions? Well, the last question I've got is about partner clubs, such as the book club and knitting club. Are there any other suggestions? Yeah, good question, Margaret. Should we create any clubs? Okay, I have a question too. I'm just curious, like, is there a feature that we've seen today or that you've seen in any other webinars that you're really excited about. Or maybe not excited at all about. <laughs> I see it's a little silent in the chat. Um, I guess some of them are kind of small enhancements that aren't too big. Oh, Heather, that's great. I'm so glad to hear that. So again, um, everyone is gonna be upgrading after November 2nd, and we will keep you posted on that. Um, oh, good, I'm, um, I see Rhonda at Round Rock is talking about multiple languages for notices. That's great, I really like that. I speak a lot of languages, so I kind of, I like that feature. Um, mm -hmm. And Ed says the failed login notice is nice. Yeah, I think that's really nice too. Karen, I see another question came in. This okay. one's about Elasticsearch. Will there be a webinar session that covers the status of Elasticsearch? Oh, that is a really good question. Would y'all like to have that in a town hall session maybe that we're including at the end of November or December? Just an update on that. Maybe we can put that in the town hall meeting. Okay, okay, cool. So to let y'all know, um, Heather asked about Elasticsearch, I believe that was Tuesday, and I checked with Nick so Elasticsearch is available in the dev sandboxes and I am putting together a video which kind of shows how to use those. So I hope to have that done by the end of the week and posted in Q&A about how you can go out and test Elasticsearch. There are a few um, bugs that need to be tested. So if you guys want to try out Elasticsearch and test it, that would be awesome. 
Um, I should say that it's in the training. It's kind of still in training mode, so it's not going to be as fast as it would be on your system, but it will give you guys a chance to check it out. And then I will suggest that we do an update on Elasticsearch, and um, maybe we can get Nick to do some kind of demo or something in the town hall meeting. Okay, great, Heather. Thanks, thanks for your feedback. Oh, okay. Awesome. Ed said that um, he and Brendan, our CEO, were chatting about Elasticsearch yesterday, and he's going to be testing some of the bugs. So go, Ed. Um, and if anybody else would like to be involved in that, then I will um, post a video about how you can do that. And I'm sure Ed is a, Ed Veal is a great resource for you to talk to about that as well. Okay. All right. Um, any other questions for us? Okay, I see Barbara's asking about the status of the OverDrive API. Okay. So um, there was an enhancement, or rather there is an enhancement of 1705 relating to OverDrive. I think this might be what you're talking about, Barbara. Um, this enhancement is currently broken. I talked to Nick about it yesterday and he's gonna chat with the person that's working on the fix in the Koha community. And so hopefully it will be coming soon. Okay, any other questions? All right. Um, well, I just wanted to say thank you all so much for taking the time to come today. And of course, if you have any other issues, please feel free to post a ticket or give us a call. Um, if there's anything we can do to help, we're here. And it was so nice to have you all here again today. And I guess just point out this upgrade webinar schedule. So we have some more next week if there are other ones you want to attend. And also in our upgrade notes, we have uh, videos of all the ones that we've done so far. So again, thanks y'all for coming. It's such a pleasure. And um, I look forward to working on some of your tickets and uh, hopefully chatting with you all one day soon. So have a wonderful, wonderful weekend. And I hope you all have some nice weather where you are. And um, I look forward to another session. All right. I'm going to go ahead and turn off the webinar now. So thank you again.